Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm really <laughs> glad to see you in, in great numbers in, in your school, which is a really impressive school. Uh, I have to tell you a little short story how and why I'm here, because we have a common connection, a common link between our schools, between uh, my colleague uh, here, who, a student who graduated first year in your school and then in, continued her studies in Budapest, in VNE, uh, and graduated finally as my students. So, Ms. Wala Ayan, thank you very much for being here. Yeah. Sorry, well, that's the digit now. Mohandas Imamari Kharajat Minhon, she did her master's degree in Budapest, and she is the key for this connection. Exactly, thank you. So, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Oltan Schramel, I'm an uh, honorary associate professor of the Department of Public Building Design and the Architecture Faculty of uh, Budapest University of Technology and Economics. This is the largest architect school of all Hungary. We have on all year more than 200 Hungarian students and approximately 80, 100 international students from all over uh, the world. Uh, if we turn off the slide, unfortunately for these uh, technical problems, I try to overbridge and accelerate myself. I will speak uh, about general questions, what I usually get from students, I'm responsible to, uh, to give lectures about design methodology. And uh, first question is always, what is design? How can we do it? Uh, what can we learn to do it? And uh, I must tell you honestly, sometimes I also don't know what to say for it, because design is such a complex discipline such a complex joy, which cannot be defined with, with some sentences, with some thoughts or, or quotations. This is, that has to be felt. So that should come finally from your heart. And uh, this is very problematic to, to uh, share with uh, students. You need any time and emotionally, I think uh, your tutors, your professors can also uh, do the same, or uh, impose my words. I collected some quotations about uh, what is design. I quoted a lot, or I collected a lot of them. Some are really clever. Uh, of course, Danish know what is design because they uh, finally developed this beautiful toy, the Lego, which is a, a toy of creation, creativity, and uh, helps for architects a lot. Some words about our heritage, because our school is the uh, oldest one in uh, Hungary, also the architectural faculty, has a long tradition, <clears throat> nearly 100 years old, and uh, our building is also a heritage itself. We occupy the whole second floor of this uh, huge building. Our heritage is also in persons, famous architects who were active in the world and graduated in our school. Probably some of, not some of them, at least one of them you should know. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned a Hungarian fellow, Karel Kosh, who, was, who played a very important role in the <coughs> Uh, identity of, of Hungarian architecture because our position is a little bit similar than yours. Not so serious, of course, but during the centuries we had the same problem to find the identity, to find our own language, not only in the literature, not only in the music, but also in the architecture. And some architects uh, did a lot for it to have a special Hungarian language in the architecture. And Kamri Kosh was famous about it. Martha Breuer, I will mention, Eric Goldfinger uh, uh, was active in England and uh, made theories for the modern architecture law. 
if you speak with Chinese architects, for them, Laszlo Gudis is very important. He was the first one who designed uh, public buildings in, in Shanghai. I don't know who was already from you in Shanghai or who have seen pictures. Now they have more than 10,000 skyscrapers. But the first buildings were designed by this Hungarian fellow. And then finally, Mr. Karoly Polony, who founded the international education in our faculty more than 30 years ago. So really some flashes about this special Hungarian um, heritage or heritage architecture designed by Karl Gosch. Uh, then the modern architecture of Ernest Goldfinger in England. And of course, uh, Arthur Breuer, probably one of the uh, main creation of him is uh, the famous armchair, which has the name Briar Chair. As well, as I mentioned, who did imagine that those times in 2015 were the biggest buildings in, in Shanghai. Now they look like cottages between uh, in a forest. And then Charles Boroni, who was very active in, in the uh, African continent and uh, had a, a status of professor in Ghana uh, before he returned to Hungary and established the international education. I'm coming from the Department of Public Building Design, and if you uh, visit this website, you can have a short look uh, to the life of students, to the life of our uh, programs, and uh, students' works. And I have to mention a professor which is a link between my, my uh, favorite profession, because I'm also a practicing architect. I believe that I cannot uh, teach something what I don't practice. So this um, it doesn't work. I think we can agree. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I'm a practicing architect specialized for healthcare design. And, uh, my this is the professor Dokan Farkadi who connects these two things because he was a famous hospital designer and uh, my first boss at the department and of course also professor. But the most pride what I have uh, and uh, my favorite picture of my lectures is that my graduated students from the last 30 years uh, coming from all over the world, as you see the uh, names are very uh, colorful mixture, starting from Greece, he was my student and now he is the vice president of the uh, Greek architect's chamber, Arash Piraesh, who has a very uh, good office in Tehran and has amazing, uh, nice buildings, Eva Ferrari, uh, came from Italy. Italy is famous about interior design, so she could find her uh, career in this field as well. Then some architects change uh, their mind and they don't design buildings, but, but uh, go to an art <coughs> direction, like uh, Kostas, also from Greece. He became a, a painter and graphic designer. Björn from, from Norway is also a, a very good architect and designs schools mostly. Ivana from Serbia is working for, for a big company. Again, the interdisciplinarity of design and, and, and or creativity is unlimited. Uh, Pavlos from Cyprus designs not only buildings but also jewels. Esa from Finland went home and started to, to make traditional Finnish buildings, although he studied, of course, not the Finnish architecture in Hungary. And then Ashkan Piraesh, uh, who uh, <coughs> is active now in Germany and works for a very famous company. Probably you know the Apple shops all over in the world, how they are designed. Uh, do you know some of them from pictures, please? So this very, very high technology-based design class 
structure. They are not designed by Norma, Sir Norma Foster's office. This is designed, all the details, by the uh, company in Germany, led by or former students who hated building construction at those times, I must tell you. So I was really amazed when I got the message from him, the fuck I have designed a temple shop in New York. <laughs> what? All the details. So it's uh, really amazing. This is a question what usually you, you, you uh, take off for uh, teachers. Okay, how? Uh, what is the method to do it? And uh, I always tell you the things I cannot say. Just have fun. This is the most important thing. So uh, you cannot be uh, <coughs> said you must do design. That's, that doesn't work. So if you don't find the fun, if even the uh, least preferred part of the design, not also why to do these things, uh, I have other programs, then at least the little part what you can enjoy, choose and take, and then you will have fun. So I cannot promise for guys to be moving in the back. Uh, being an architect is a role. A popular role. Uh, you can see just the films. I collected some how many uh, famous artists played architects' role, like Richard Gere, or Lyle Neeson, or Gary Cooper. Your grandmothers would know it in Google. Tom Selleck, Tom Hanks, so really famous guys. Ken Reeves, <laughs> and of course, Simpsons as well. And what is waiting for you as an architect? So I like very much this diagram how different professions uh, do sleep. Yes, you can sleep well. I do not for you. This is waiting for you, but I think you know very well. You get enough job uh, to, to, to sleep like this. Yes, yes. So the method is the same everywhere. So how have fun? And we try to keep also in the school uh, that to show students how to have fun and to organize programs. But I could see very shortly already, already in, in your uh, floors that you do also in a very good way uh, these things. You can find uh, fun in, in, in the worst work as well, struggling with scissors and papers. And uh, of course, very important is that to have fun in teamwork because uh, architecture cannot be done alone, for sure. That does not exist. So this is the time <coughs> when uh, you can learn how to cooperate with, uh, with your friends, with your colleagues, and other disciplines as well. And then, of course, you have to learn also this role how to speak for, for uh, clients, for, for, for colleagues, for students, in, in good case, and uh, how to present your work, how to sell yourself. Sorry to say this, but uh, we have to sell our service, otherwise you start. And if you accomplish them, please celebrate. That's very important. Competitions play a very important role for students. And probably this is a part where even countries who have such problems of, of, uh, of uh, with the borders, let's say, political, uh, you can open connections to international competitions. I know it because when I started my career, we belonged still to the Warsaw Pact, and we were as closed from the western part of the world as uh, you are now. And that was a possibility to have to <coughs> uh, do of international competitions and sometimes we could achieve uh, uh, awards. That was a great thing. We felt at least that we are connected <coughs> to the world and not uh, fenced uh, by political forces and please celebrate the victory as well.
what you need. Of course, you need a skill that uh, can be trained in schools if you have enough thirst for it. So that is, of course, a necessary thing. Creativity, I think it's obvious. And don't forget the courage to take the responsibility uh, about your decisions, even when it looks great. The taste, which is, uh, can be taught. I don't think so. so we, we take it from home, we take it in our plots, uh, but uh, can be developed, of course. Respect, very important in any case of the life, but in architecture, it is extremely important. Tolerance uh, to your um, teammates, to your teachers, uh, uh, to the system, in order to grow uh, positive energies and uh, and good creations. Need a cooperation. Architects fell usually the mistake that we can solve everything. No, we cannot. We need engineers around us, we need lawyers sometimes, we need uh, lots of different disciplines to uh, do finally a good job in architecture. We need some tools. Look, so uh, problems of different systems, and we need the dreams. So to, feel, to fulfill the dreams you came here with, is very important. And of course, you need the pride when you achieve some uh, victory and celebrate always. Oh. Very important is the participation. Participation of all members of the creation. This is an example. Uh, when all students participated in social works to erect some buildings or to complete uh, old buildings, um, restore old buildings, or uh, remove some asbestos uh, from social institutions who have no money for, for developing. You can find all these such things and then to be integrated in such a uh, positive um, movement is always it helps a lot for a, for a clear way of thinking. Of course, it works also inverted. In the design to participate people, Talik will uh, mention really nice samples about it. That's why I don't want to say more words about it. And you need the health, and this is the connection to the next part of the lecture, uh, which is about public buildings. Uh, and a part of public buildings. I collected again definitions of public buildings from different uh, countries. The, uh, one is worse than the other, at least in my mind. So they, they sound really official and doesn't say anything. So that's why I made my, myself. Uh, public building is where you are never alone. And I indicated or I illustrated with this picture, which is probably controversial, if you don't see uh, not only the picture, but behind. This lady is in a chapel and not alone. He, she is uh, with our Lord together. So even the smallest public building is where you are never alone. And now, thanks God, we are several in this, in this place, in this uh, public space, and uh, I think it was also a great job to design this building. Public buildings have different uh, arts. The most important thing is that this is the place where the consumers and the attendants meet. So this is the part of the meeting what we design as a public building. And I will turn to healthcare design for hospitals, which is my mania. And uh, started in a time when uh, someone didn't need any building to uh, provide help, but this time is over. 
and there were some great moments in the medical sciences uh, which always pushed a little bit the architecture in, in a new way of the design of hospitals. Uh, very interesting how this, this uh, center points moved from, from the ancient Greeks to the Roman Empire, then to, to Constantinople, then to the Middle East, then a little bit to the northern African zone, because in Europe, Christianity stopped medical sciences. Then, with the Renaissance, came back to Europe, so, uh, and always developed and built on the base. So I think there is no more democratic science than the medical science, and there is no more human science. That's why to support the science with architecture, is as important and as uh, fascinating. Yeah, I forgot to mention the name of this lady, lady with the lamp, Florence Nightingale, who was a nurse. And as I know, your university uh, trains also nurses, so probably uh, they know uh, very well her name, who, who uh, discovered very obvious things. Just wash hands. Change your bed clock. Simple things, but save hundreds, thousands of uh, uh, life of people. And uh, also in the healthcare architecture, um, I'm not keen for, for the very modern high tech architecture of Australia, of the United States, of the United Kingdom. Okay, great, they can afford it. They can do it for sure, but there are approximately 70% of the globe where they don't know about these uh, sciences and, and they need aid, they need service. And some architects do it really well. Uh, one of my favorite is Diabeto Francis Carey from Burkina Faso, uh, who designs not high-tech hospitals, but very humanist for his own nation because he knows very well what his nation really need. Don't need uh, computer tomograph and uh, MRI systems and nuclear medicine, no. Simple, healthy, treating, caring facility and good design for them. For them. Yes, this is also hospital design, what we have to learn. Uh, thanks God, we are not allowed. <coughs> we cooperate with several engineering disciplines like medical technology designers who help us to furnish this amazing rooms and to design the envelope around it. Yeah, I mentioned already Zoltan Barkosti, who designed the first hospital after the Second World War in Hungary and finally uh, infected me with this uh, part. Some of my jobs, and uh, to say some, some uh, words, what is the beauty to, in the design of it. This is a small town in, in Hungary, which is half size than Ramallah. Uh, named Kaposvár, and uh, the extension of the hospital was uh, planned by the local government, and there was a big discussion how this uh, extension had to be done. And uh, they wanted to put here a tower which would have been a landmark for, for the hospital because of course the hospital director is keen for having a, a landmark hospital. This is my hospital, this tower in the middle of the city. And uh, it was a big fighting uh, to, to achieve and to change his mind that sorry, this tower is out of scale of the town. It, it would be very rude in this environment. And then finally, I chose this structured system of the building, which is not higher than the existing buildings, or at least a little bit higher, and very important, not higher than the trees around the building. So now with this solution, we could provide a really humanist environment for the patients using local materials. We don't have stone at home. That's why we prefer rather to brick. And we used already, of course, the technology of the design, the 
computer, but I must warn you, computer cannot design. Computer is just a clever pencil, not more. When you design, take your pen, take your pencil, take your paper, or put a stick and you can draw in the sand, on the ground, on the paper, anywhere, that's design. And when you did it, you found out, then you can put into computer. But first, build a model, draw, draw, draw. This is the way of design. Computer is just a tool which supports you. Of course, you have to learn it how. So we did also, uh, we did, my <coughs> young colleagues are really good in this field. Also, some uh, really developed uh, operation rooms. And another job is a children's hospital where I was thinking and I went to the children's hospital. I spent uh, several days and nights there as a worker, as a cleaner. I, I did nurse work to learn it, how this system works what the children feel when they enter such a building. And then I decided to make something uh, which reminds them for a Lego stones. Of course, this, this uh, yesterday for this slide I got a question how this colored building fits to the environment. Uh, in Hungary we don't have this, this uh, uh, standardized look of buildings like here you have uh, this uh, limestone, much more uh, colorful, so that's why I could afford the solution. And finally now, uh, what I could achieve is, is an effect for arriving children to stop crying and to say, oh, big Lego, <laughs> that's enough. That's, I, I could achieve to stop pain, to stop crying, to stop this or to reduce the stress of the patient, uh, patients and the parents. And that's our mission. At least one of our missions, where the important one. Elderly patients need something different, of course, uh, more terraces, more modest uh, kind of architecture, uh, with a comfort. Now I don't uh, give more details. But also very important are the colors, um, which can solve this uh, so-called hospital um, psychological push. Very important is to decide when to make a new building and when to make a reconstruction. Uh, you have been a situation here in Palestine that uh, nearly five million people in a very limited area. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, our globe is also limited. And every place what we built is lost for dreams, lost for trees, lost for wells. Uh, if you have a building, an existing one, it was also a question. Keep the existing building or replace with a new one somewhere else and leave it abandoned. Okay? But then we lost again 1,000 1, more square meters uh, from grass, from trees, from birds, and to build another building. And finally, everything would be occupied by buildings. That cannot be our goal. So always, your decisions have consequences. And this is our responsibility to say, OK, I can extend only this yellow part, and that's enough. The rest, I can refurbish the old building, suffering, believe me, to, to consider the existing structures, uh, how operation rooms can fit to it. It was really struggling period. Also, the, uh, using cars in, in, in such serious places. Don't forget, uh, these guys who operate there concentrate on, on a little red uh, spot, sometimes six, seven hours and every bad movement of them uh, can decide dead or alive. Means, what can you do as an environmental designer in this area? 
to have some places where he or she can look up and her or his eyes can have uh, relaxed by, for example, in this case, colors. Also, patients need uh, colors to be informed, and also other uh, institutions where no patients are, but, but workers uh, for different um, uh, activities, which are sometimes uh, pressing. This is a dissection room and, and was a very interesting project of mine, the Forensic Institute in Budapest, of the Semmelweis University, the biggest medical university of Hungary. And when uh, we started to design, uh, then we wanted to use colors. There was a shock for the uh, leaders of the university. What? Colors in the dissection room? This should be gray, white. Why? Is it not enough gray and white? But were on, and uh, finally the professor uh, decided, yes, do it. And now it became so successful that even from the United States come delegates here to, to organize congresses, just because of the uh, environment, but uh, is much better than the standard on the world. I mentioned uh, the importance of models. I always start my design with, with building simple models. Uh, that was an ambulance station, what, uh, how I started, and finally uh, was erected on the same way. Or at that bank, again, how I started, and how my young colleague started. So I have not started, but uh, developed it. Because they are very professional using computers. That's good, I'm not. And then this is the final uh, result, which is a mixture of these two things. And this is a good way of, of cooperation between generations. Yeah. This is the ambulance station again. And finally, uh, I would like to warn you uh, about your decisions. Um, probably you know this building in, in Milan or in Italy. Uh, became very famous. Uh, when I show it, I was shocked, really, uh, because I know Milano more or less. They have place enough, uh, so they occupied with la very luxury dwellings, a pretty huge uh, spot on the ground, from trees. And okay, to reduce them this bad effect, they put the trees on the twentieth floor. If you were a tree, where would you be planted more? <laughs> Thank you. Of course, that means also you have to fight for this uh, point of view with your client. And you have to find this compromise uh, when to say, OK, you are right. So very important is to feel the filter in your mind when you see magazines as so solutions, then please don't be enthusiastic immediately. Uh, a little bit consider what is behind this decision. Also, when you uh, decide about materials, and I think from this point of view, Palestine is a really nice uh, example, uh, that you use the local stone as a basic material, and all over where now I could uh, uh, look around, I can see always this local stone, it's, it's really good, it's not needed to uh, destroy uh, the land somewhere else on the other part of the world just to have, I don't know, black stone here. Uh, yeah, okay, but you need to build off something, that's true, uh, but if you, if the same thing happens, for example, in Indonesia, then still you have to carry it here. And this carriage needs also energy. And, and, uh, so this is a global responsibility. The least you uh, should transport materials, the best decisions you have. When you decide, for example, to make buildings of wood, and it has to be transported from uh, Brazil or, or I don't know from where, then things don't affect what you, your decision can cause there. So, our job is beautiful, but you see ours 
accountability is really bad. Now you've got answer how to make design? I'm pretty sure now. <laughs> so that's why sorry for us and thank you for your attention.
For example, Antonio Santelli is an Italian futurist architect. Unfortunately, died in the First World War, but before he designed visions of the future cities that actually came true, you know, somehow. He was a visionary. That's what you should be, to dream. But what is the dream of the future? Because back then, now, we can analyze it that Huck Ferris, with his drawing, how he calculated how should be the ideal skyscraper, he influenced architecture. He was a renderer, you know, he draw, he didn't build, but he influenced architects, and this became the city, uh, the American city of skyscrapers. You know, Friedman also influenced a lot of architects, and we are proud of her uh, because uh, uh, it's uh, Hungarian of origin. But of course, this was not yet built, you know, the city which is floating above the other city, or Buckminster Fuller's bones. They were built only a smaller scale, but still he wanted to use it to protect cities, to make giant envelopes, or Arigram, you should know about, of course. Well, he thought that robotics will be so advanced that cities will be able to walk, you know, from one place to the other, and then meet and have a big party. And that's very good uh, as an idea. And many architects thought this, that it actually is reality, like the metabolist of Japan, Arakisha Zaki here. The city in the air was a real plan, you know. He said, we can do it now, why don't we do it? To make people more in the sky, to leave more ground space, of course. And they started to build it in prototypes, and the maximum, I think, was in 1970, when this big dreaming started in the 20th century, uh, throughout the 60s also, uh, manifested in the biggest span, the biggest building span in, in, in what humanity has built before, in the Osaka uh, Bird uh, Exposition in the Festival Plaza. And in the middle there was a robot, you know, a huge robot saying things to people. So it was future came true. But it's not what we are living in, isn't it? Even though this was like 50 years ago. So somehow our dreams stopped. What happened to them? For example, from where I came from Budapest, we also had these dreamers, and then Zalata in the 1960s designed very crazy structures. And then uh, with some more linear structures, he thought the future of the city should be of these great big infrastructures. And yes, we were building a lot, a lot of housing, but they were much more simple. You know? They were much more this mass housing, which you can see everywhere in the world. Uh, of course, then, humanity also believed in this, but by doing this mass housing, we have to demolish the small scale, traditional infrastructure that we had, and we gave space to citizens, which were believed to be better, of course, but not that futuristic, and in this sense, something stopped in development, I will talk to you about it. But of course, this state also was developing, because Corbusier in the 1920s said, Let's make big cities out of these freestanding houses, a city for three million. He wanted to demolish Paris. Paris, just the Eiffel Tower and the Notre Dame, all the rest would be like that. And this was advancing, you know, because every inhabitant would have a view, sunshine, a bathroom, something that today maybe is normal, but back then it was totally not normal. And many of these were built on the earth, actually. This is in San Luis. Uh, it was built by Esata Minoru in '56. He was the architect of the Bird Trade Center, the double towers that. But it was small down. What? Small down. It was small down. It was a upper bottom, not bottom up. So we didn't think about what people want to live and the next people they want to live in. Yes, but they did think because actually they invited here environmental psychologists. You know what is that? That's very new science. It was born then. Yeah. Psychologists who said what people would like. They invited them, this is what people would like. Is it true? <laughs> Charles Jenks, the first postmodern architect, said, in this picture is the end of modernist era. The end of the era when humanity uh, actually thought that by building a lot of this modernist, functionalist building, we can resolve our problems. And it was teared down only after you can see, 16 years of existence. 16 years of existence, you know? If buildings from here, from 2002, were built, turned down because they don't work anymore. It's a failure. Why did they do it? Let's first see what happened to the original construction in 1956. They also teared down a lot of buildings. 
Please, it was a slum. Look at the buildings. Well, if you look at well, today, these will be the cafes, the very trendy apartments that everyone would like to live. No, look at the scale. It's very nice. You only have to repaint it a bit, no? Back then, it was full of drug, crime, poverty. So they said, we cannot resolve it. We have to tear it down and build this beauty. You see, the city, not anymore, tear it down and build it. Why did they build it? They built it to make a better human life. A middle class, nice, safe. Why did they tear it down? Poverty, crime, drug problems, lack of money. So what was the message? That building, the act of building, the act of making architecture, couldn't resolve the problems of humanity. That was a very bad, bad and big message. And actually, it still lives, because if you see this site today, forest, the solution, no. But the failure of urban development on the large scale. So somehow, I think I totally agree with Charles Jens that in 1972, uh, something happened when we realized that humanity cannot really resolve by functionalist thinking, by just building, 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 by large scale urban development, the uh, problems of humanity. And that's why in 17 we still build the Festival Plaza of Osaka after not anymore. No such buildings anymore. Of course we have, but not in this humanistic sense to save the world. But of course we didn't learn much because if you go to China, of course, you see the same today. If you go to Shanghai, that we saw how in the 1930s, it was still 1920s, nice Art Deco buildings. If you go to Shenzhen, there's nothing in that time period. But then what you have today is very uniform. It could be in Canada. If you go to Africa, you see the same today. Built by Chinese money. If you go to Istanbul, Turkey, you see the same without context. And the sad thing also in Istanbul is that they actually convince people with force to leave their homes and to slap it away to build those beauties which we already proved in 1970s that it's total failure. So, so somehow you know that this large-scale urban development is the problem itself, not a solution. And you know a lot about it. So there's a lot to do, and I don't want to explain it more about this picture. But what is the solution? Still today, architects are dreaming big and want to build big. You all know Bjarke uh, Engels, the big? Famous today, yeah. they build big. Let's take this. No? Look at this uh, cross tower and so. But the same guy, when he was invited to a 2030 urban future competition of art by Audi, of course it was about mobility, he could also dream differently. Architects dream, I know that. He could dream of a world that the environment is the same as today, only the floor is changing, and this floor has this digital infrastructure and the uh, cars are self-driving, and there's a prototype, it works, and people have a safety zone, so everyone can move without anything else than just digital floor, and there will be no accidents anymore, and we don't need to uh, make uh, uh, different, difficult infrastructure. And this is a dream, you know, it still needs a bit of too big infrastructure, because to make this digital floor, it's unsafe. But, it's not about the building. This building exists today, this building exists today. Or let's see another example, even better, and this is Jürgen Meyer. He's an architect dreamer. Huh? He knows how to build big dreams that have no sense, but it's very beautiful. Huh? It's made of wood, actually, in the city. This, uh, uh, this guy, in the same competition, said, the future will look like this is Paris today, these things will not be needed anymore, so the future will be just the same as today, a bit clearer. Hmm? Why? Because we don't need not even this digital floor, we just need our cars to act like giant iPhones with augmented reality. They drive themselves, they don't need to design, they know about themselves, digital technology. With all the green screens, they can show you just the data you need, 
you know, it's like giant television. You drive through the city, you see where are the best sales for the best shoes, and that's very important. So this dream doesn't involve building anymore. But it involves technology that already exists. Ten years ago, Google already had a self-driving car. It still doesn't work, of course, but we are getting there. We are getting there, you know? And on your smartphones, there are these applications of augmented reality. You can look around. You know, in big cities, it already works. Or if not, you can just play Pokemon Go, and it works the same. So we have the technology. Uh, and it is the future of our urban development, but it doesn't look large in scale. You know, actually, it's invisible. The future technology to build our cities is so small. It's so small it fits under your skin. It, you could have a chip just right here and make ID for all. My favorite project to see what is the city today is this one. It's on a university campus in Norway by Matthias. It's visualizes Wi-Fi infrastructure. You know? Something that I came here, said, okay, do I have Wi-Fi? Oh, what is the password? Can I send a message home? Here there is no Wi-Fi, here there is good Wi-Fi, you know? This is the bad place and this is the good place of the campus. This is the infrastructure of the city, the one that you all use. Maybe not Wi-Fi anymore, but mobile phone, you know? But it's the same. How big is the internet? receive the of your phone. This is the city visualized and you don't see it. It's invisible because it's filled by small gadgets like your phone that knows everything about you. It knows more about you than you. And unfortunately other people know about you because of that. But that's another issue. But we can also use it not for bad but for good. We can use it to measure how cities work. This early work 10 years ago from MIT Sensible lab made by architects, very important, you know, I'm not speaking about other professions here, I'm speaking about architecture school, measure the activity of mobile phones in space during the Madonna concert. And of course, this is the stadium that the concert was, and you can see that. And you can see, if you sit in space, how people move in the city. You can see where they check in in Foursquare, where they check in in Twitter how they share the photographs, where they do it. You can map the city, and I actually do that, so I know a bit about it, because I also research how tourists use the city. Mm -hmm. So this is my city, Budapest, and this is the castle district, the chain bridge, which is beautiful, and the basilica, and the hero square, and it's all there on this map, showing the intensity of tourist use, just because you make photos. And you make photos there. And you don't make photos here. Of course, that's not so I measure not only how tourists, but how other uh, visitors are using differently the city. More spread if you're local, more concentrated. To the it's a data that serves for design. It's the data that we know how to make the cities better because we know how it works. And we can check how it And that's another uh, thing I will not talk to you about, but you have to understand that the bricks of the future city, data, data, something that we collect here now, something that we collect day-to-day -day basis, something that we collect so much that in the past two years we produced 95% of the whole data of humanity. That means that in the library of Alexandra that was destroyed, the data there was half a second that we produce today. Because not quality, quantity, of course. We produce quantity today. But of quantity, we can do things. For example, we can optimize solutions. The future is the Internet of Everything, the Internet of Things, that everything is connected, not only your mobile phone, but you know, but things, sensors in the cars, in the streets, in your clothes, maybe. And then these sensors provide data that connect systems, and these systems can be optimized, better healthcare, better energy, better retail, better transport. And is it urban design? Yeah, according to the big companies like Philips, this is urban design. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need architecture, you know? It's just buildings. There are buildings. It needs systems of Siemens as the same. Healthcare, mobility, financing, to make better cities, to make more competitive cities. Cisco says the same. They're all little city models, which has nothing new in that. Who cares about the architecture and the urban planning anymore? 
What you care about is new education, communication, retail, transportation, how to optimize this with data. And of course, sometimes it's really smart. Like Amsterdam made a system out of these technologies where citizens not only can see what's happening in their city, but they can have participation, you know, they can say what to do, what to not. They can have better information on traffic, on pollution, on how what to do with their waste, on how to go to work, on where to start a new business, all in a smart city platform, which is great. But if you look at it, and this is the future of cities, it was invented by big companies. This is the diagram of how smart city visibility and marketing is works worked in the city a few years ago. These companies are the same as the big cement companies, the big construction companies, only that now they make other type of big infrastructure. Not concrete, not stone, but data. It's big infrastructure. And we are back to large infrastructure. We are back to large scale urban development. And probably it's back to the old mistakes. Now, because you all use a phone, you give your data to private companies who are very rich, and they own the world of data. Now you still, we do the same as we did it with the big constructions, only we do it with the information technology. And these run our cities, and we don't care anymore how our cities look like, unfortunately, but they work because of this data. And this is maybe not the real smart city. Maybe the real smart city is when we are really think smart and start to say what is local, maybe what is small, but that can really make a better city. Because smart city technologies don't work in the world, nowhere. There are big projects, big money, but you don't see a real smart city that is really different than the other cities that are not that smart. They are all the same competitiveness. Sometimes business is better, sometimes transport is better. In Budapest, we have a very nice smart city transport system. That works. But that's one service. But the smart city, as such, doesn't exist because the real smart city is not about digital city. And even the digital companies like IBM, who makes smart city, when he makes the advertisement of the smart city, he knows that. The real smart city is to see things small, think local, and think smart. Look at these billboards. All of them are smart because they offer something to the city. Unlike the technology, of course, that they want to sell. Yeah, no. I'm very short now. This is a project of Smart City. It is a project made by our students who started this design in a university uh, program during their masters. And after diploma, they built their own little uh, engineering firm to make this alive. And today, they deployed 70 of these in, in cities of Hungary, which is very simple. In the university, they found out that we have a system of fire hoses, which is, of course, connected to drinking water. Because what else? We don't have two waters. We have just one water. It's drinking water. So we have drinking water on the streets that nobody uses, just one times one in 100 years. No? Hopefully not even. So why not install it with a little uh, fountain so everyone can use it day to day to drink? You don't have to make another infrastructure for drinking. You already have it. You just need a little gadget of, uh, I don't know, maximum $1,000. Uh, and they live out of this today. They have a fear of architecture by doing this solution. And this can form a system. Like in New York City, in this, already in the 60s, they find out that city is more than just making zoning and regulations. So there was this William White, the founder of Project for Public Spaces, who measure how people use the city and which is the good public space. That was the question. Which is the good public space? The public space where people like to be and what to, what to do it. And they, where people sit down and how to do it. And he said, I work for three years to measure with camera systems, the public spaces, and my result is people tend to sit where there are places to sit. Whew, that was a big research, huh? <laughs> Now, of course, it was a big research because since then, if you see the zoning law of New York, which is the law, you know, how to build, this is, these are some pages from it. And this is the updated version. How to make a seating in the public space. How many percent of fixed individual space uh, seats or movable seats, social seating must be provided. They can move the chairs. This is quality of life in urban design. 
it's not a big thing, you know, it's not about skyscrapers that you know about in New York. It's about how to make the city life. And this project for public spaces works since then to make the city more livable. And, if, and of course, in New York, it's a strange city because it's a global city, big city, but still, it's very livable. Because they said everyone has the right to live in a great place, but more importantly, everybody has the right to contribute to making a place where they already live great. So everybody should be able to move his little chair and sit down with everyone and make a community and make even more. What is this more? And that's what actually I'm here to talk about, I almost finished, <laughs> is that, for example, it's Christie in the 70s. You remember the 70s, end of modernism? He and uh, her, she and her guerrilla gardener friends who were just like, you know, little hooligans. Find this empty space in New York, climbed the fence and started to dig and say, let's do a garden, just because we like to, because we don't like this empty space and we want to do something useful for to be a community. And they did this community garden, which was the first in the world, which is a real community garden, not for food production, but for community. And the city was so impressed that they actually uh, declared it official community garden, they gave the right to use it for one dollar, and today it's a public park, the Miss Christie Community Garden. This was the born, born of community gardens, and today there are 183 in New York, and they are constantly moving, changing, and we also have some in Budapest because we were inspired. And I will talk to you about that, but first in New York, like, this is so nice, you know, to be in a democracy and to be able to just occupy land and say, let's have some olive trees here, and we are all happy. No, it's not like that. In the 60s, there were a lot of fights in America, and was very Europe, in Paris, and in Rome, and so on, where young people were fighting not because they wanted to change the government to make end of capitalism. Yes, they wanted a bit, but what they really wanted, and that's why they won, is to make something like in Berkeley, California, to make a public space that they can meet. And they fight, and the military came, and they shoot people, and students die. But that was a hard, hard time. But they achieved because they were realistic in saying, we have right to what? To our own space. So to what we want to use, what we can control. And it's still happening today. In New York, there are 183 community gardens. But many times, the investor comes and says, hey, this is my plot, and now it's time, because the property business, to build. So, hi guys, it was nice from you that you didn't let my garden, my plot uh, litter, and go, you know, to the bad image. But now, go away, we go and make a nice skyscraper here. And then the community says, no, hey, we did a garden here. I know that it was temporary, but we did it for ourselves, and now we think this is the right place to make it permanent, to make a park. So we want, as people, to design the city as to add public space to the city. How do we do it? We stay there. We protest. And the police comes. And then if there are a few people, the police will get them there and the skyscraper will be built. If the community was strong enough, the city intervened and said, of course, we cannot do nothing now. So they like this. They are a big community. So we will pay the investor, the city, and this will be declared public park. Urban design by the community. It's not automatic. It's hard, okay? And it's done by the people, the new actors of urban development. Because the large projects were always initiated by political politicians, investors, industries, and architects who want to dream big. But people, people need a place to be, to be a home, to be in a community. And this bottom-up urban development is towards what we, I think, are going now, and our profession is going. So, some examples from Hungary now. Parts uh, for the design. It's a new tool taught in many, many of the universities as well. How to do it, you know, how to get together a community. And yes, you have to do it in practice. It's not very easy to, to just talk about it. This uh, architecture studio, it's a landscape architecture studio, we ran one of the work to make this uh, this is already the finished version, Teraki Square. Uh, new public space, it was an old public space with drug addicts. You remember drug, poverty? This was happening here. 
And they said, okay, we have the commission, but we will not do it normally. We will involve the community. And they made 14 sessions in the community. Nobody believed it will work because poverty dropped, so the community was not very bad. But they found the people who were active members of the community, and they made a real community. They designed the square with them, together with them. And then when it was built, this community was actually feeling home there. And they maintain it. And today, in this poor district with problems, you have this community garden. Now, it's not a community garden. It's just a public space designed by Parsifal Design, where there are events and where people love to be, especially the community that made it. It's a success story. It has its problems that I don't have time to talk about it. But this is a very good example of how to do it. And actually, I have some experience because I'm also president of the Hungarian Architecture Center, which is an NGO. So I think it's very important for me to connect teaching, design, and my other professional life, being an activist, being the leader of the, the biggest architecture NGO, which initially started in 2006 because we had a building for us, and that's why it's Architecture Center, because we had a center of architecture, and we made art, you know? We made exhibitions. We invited a lot of architects. And then we realized, even because we had to move from one place to another, we occupied an eight-story high office building after just a little shop, so we were constantly in the move, that actually architecture is important, and we still have this mission, but it's more important to think about the city and how to use it as a community. This is our place today, since 2015. It's a co-working place where young architects and designers come to work as well. It's an event space. It's an exhibition space where we have exhibitions, for example, and we do also professional work like edit books on the vacant city, on the uh, civic city, on the adaptive city, and for example, this exhibition on Budapest, this is the venue, about all the projects that were community-based projects of urban development. And it's great work we do there, I think. It's very hard. For example, we do this uh, Rock Up Manitva uh, program that were involved that were culminated in an open source festival and they noticed there are so many old empty spaces in the city so they don't they're not able to fill it with, with, with uh, uh, shops because they get too high price and what to do we were the mediators between investors who had the shop and shop uh, keepers who didn't have the money to rent it to try out new things to make a festival what if this shop would be for one month freely used for a function that's a bit more artistic, a bit more civil, but maybe it's even better than to stay empty for years. And some of the, the, the results is that some of the shops filled with light after because they could make a lower the price and make a good uh, arrangement. We also do innovative participatory uh, projects, like this one was right like now. A big industrial area you know, in Budapest, the biggest was abandoned after socialism to private investors. So it was one industry, but now it's 800, 800 different companies. And there's no state there, so they cannot you know, decide how to, how to cooperate. So we built a giant Lego model, Lego. And we made a digital projection on it with the sensors of cameras that people can insert other type of Lego, saying this is now not industry anymore, but maybe uh, lighter thing, you know, like a bakery or maybe even a hotel for workers, and what happens, how it will change, and why it's important, because many actors can do it at the same time, you know? Modeling is, Lego is something everyone understands. So how, okay, so I want to do a bakery, what if I put it here? What if I put my workers here? How it will change? We can simulate uh, 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 acts of property, prices, and so on, by putting elements there. So how to be innovative in participation? Of course, we introduced the first community gardens, that's our program. We were inspired by Berlin, by New York. And in 2011, it came through in the Munich Park first, then here, community gardens, empty building, empty plots, how to turn it live for the community. And we are still the biggest to give advice on that in Hungary and do this. And we are very proud of our festival, Budapest 100. It's a festival where Buildings open up to the public, but buildings that have 100 years of celebration. Birthday not of people, but birthday of, people, of, of your heritage, of your building. And by opening these buildings, the community living in these buildings becomes proud of their own heritage. And because they become proud, they will start to care about it. 
You know, we go in Palestine, we see that you make not wonderful buildings and you have wonderful apartments, but between the apartments, you don't care. You don't care. If you would be more pride of what you have in your cities, maybe you would care and clean up, you know, and make some. So we make participatory uh, 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 questions there. We make a festival to celebrate these buildings by the community itself. And of course, the last question I have here is how to fund this, how to get alive? Because you know, big companies are there to have money and make big constructions still today, of course. We, as a small organization, we work, for example, on a Kickstarter-like crowdfunding campaigns on the internet, so the public can give money to this festival. We make a book, we sell it, about the buildings of the festival. We make, of course, different business uh, collaborations, so for sponsorship, that they can uh, uh, sponsor our festival and we give some service. We even make our own beer. Mm -hmm. We have to be very creative. So we, we are in need of money, and what we invented is to make the Sitan, is the, for our 10th birthday, the first beer made by architects for architecture, funding architecture. It's an uh, Indian beer, and many very famous architects were on the Biennale trying out our beer. So we sell this for a high price to find culture. We have to be very creative, but of course, this is just how we work. To make the real cooperative city uh, live, we have to have new strategies. So the last question, how do you fund it? First of all, this type of urbanism, when you cooperate with people, is cheaper. It's very important. How do you fund it? So technical urbanism is one of my favorite uh, uh, theories gathering the work of all we all do. It's about these making guys who say all these interventions, local interventions, which are cheap, done by the community, you know, don't need much, much money, a little of grass, a little of recycled paint, a little of paint. They can be tactical because instead of building up a big strategy and spending a lot of money of doing it, you try out in the tactical things, the tactics of what if I close one parking lot, you know, it's part of it. What if I paint this part of the square? It doesn't work because there's a traffic jam. Okay, let's change it. It's cheap. Test it. And if it works, we know we did something good. We can invest a bit more money to make it permanent. The biggest example of this is New York, of course, uh, Times Square and the Broadway, which is a very strange thing in New York because it's the only street not perpendicular and parallel, it's cutting through. So there's always big traffic jam there were in Times Square in this place. So what they did. The city is that on Thanksgiving 2009, which is a celebration, as we just right now, uh, they closed down Times Square for the celebrations. Mm -hmm. With this, you know, with this deviation in things. And they went to the local hardware shops and bought foldable chairs. You know, this is green, this is purple, because they went to the store, okay, we want foldable chairs. Oh, we only have 300. Okay, then we go to the other store and buy another 300 <laughs> of a different color. They put it there, it was a huge success immediately. People said, oh, Times Square now, no cars. Let's sit down, let's have a break, a cafe. So they say, okay, so it's good. So people, uh, we will keep it closed for another few months, just to try out. You know, not permanently, you will not change your beautiful taxi drives, just it out. So 2009, after 2010, they used some paint, very cheap paint, pink paint, to say this is pedestrian now to try out. And they started a campaign to learn on how this works. They started to measure with GPS technology, you remember the data? How fast the buses are going, the taxis are going, how fast is it to commute? They used surveys, how people feel, they use service, how much is the revenue of the shops? And at the end, they presented to the public a big study saying, with a very good video that I don't have time to play, saying everything is better. Because we cut this, uh, this stage of leak road, taxis are faster, buses are faster, people spend two times more in, in these places, and they feel much better. Safety is better, no more you know, traffic jams and accidents. And said, okay, so any objections? We made faster traffic, we made safer road, we made better spending. 
happier people. Any objections? No? So let's make a proper competition. It's no end of it. Let's put down some stone. It's, you know, it cost a lot. Maybe it was important for Palestine. It cost a lot, but, but, it was only five years after the project, so they could try it out. And if there was a failure, they could cut it up. You know, it doesn't cost anything. So technical reason costs much cheaper. It's much cheaper. And then these projects, of course, on the other hand, are about community involvement. So if you look at the high line, it's the beautiful public space, this linearity, in an over the band on the uh, high line that you all know about. And how it worked? It worked that the city wanted to demolish it because it was it was an old uh, yeah old train line for industry actually, but it was not used since the 1980s. And the city said let's demolish it. It cost a lot, and it had an investor who was actually owning it. Said so, ah, it's too much money. I don't touch it. You know? And then okay, the, the city will put in money to destroy it. And this guy there on the beginning said no, stop. This is a very poor neighborhood in New York, with a lot of crime, drugs, you remember the problem? But here we have a green corridor above us, and he made city walks in the green corridor, and he made say the tracks, hey, don't, don't destroy it. And the community started to attend and grow and grow, and then it was people like you here, then it was even more, and they made friends of High Line, how to get involved, become a member, become a monthly supporter, make a donation, adopt a tree. At the end, this association raised $44 million, $44 million, plus some private funds, to make Highline uh, true. And the city commissioned them to be the new host of Highline. So it's not a city project, it's an NGO-run project. The NGO, the city, of course, finances, of course, but it would finance the demolition as well, don't forget. And now, this NGO makes the festivals, he made the competition run by Gilders Coffee Diorio, one of the biggest architecture films, very nice work, but done by the civilians, the competition itself. And what you have around it? Urban <coughs> development. Remember, drug, crime, poor poverty, not anymore. I know the story that here there was a police department, the only police department in, in, in New York that doesn't have a base, it always moves. It moves to the most infected area of crime. And it was based here for a decade. And now it moved. Without building the Brutigo, hmm? with making a community department, and then investors will build their own things. Very nice architects will do it. The last project is Highline 2.0 is the low line. And this is where you guys also come into the picture because some architects who were trained and getting graduated when the high line was conceived said, hey, we want to dream as well. So what the community needs? He needs his new public spaces. It's good for innovation. We don't have any more high lines in Manhattan because that was the only one. That after. But we have underground trolley terminal, underground train terminal which we don't use since four years. So let's make an underground park. Let's make a park underground. That's stupid. <coughs> no, it's dreamy. It is how architecture, engineering can give new types of spaces to the world. This is the essence of architecture, to make something new. And they say it's possible. I don't believe it. City doesn't believe it. But the public on Kickstarter, the crowdfunding, believe that. And they raised instead of 100,000, $155,000, a young architecture studio. Imagine now, you will graduate here with your friends from the architecture studio and get from the public this money for a project. Would you like that? Okay. They did it. And from this money, they built a prototype of technology, advanced technology, cost $155,000, and made a festival underground where there were trees actually living for months, and 20,000 people came to visit, and they said, yes, we want this, and now we are ready to finance it even more to be the first on the ground park in, uh, in the world to come true, not only as a temporary, but as something which is there. Urban innovation, the most advanced public space, the real dreaming in architecture come true because of community.
So don't forget this. And that's my message. It's a dream. It's a dream. Yeah. 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 